Now, this Monday, the 11th of April, France's controversial ban of the Islamic full-face veil comes into effect. With other countries in talks to do the same, and with Belgium's ban already in place, is this an example of what some people might perceive as Europe's growing Islamophobia, as well as being a breach of a woman's human right to wear as she chooses? Or is it a sensible step towards stemming what some see as a worrying, disempowering trend with young Muslim women wearing the full veil? Well, to discuss this issue and its potential ramifications for the rest of Europe and the Middle East are joining me from our London studio, journalist and commentator Nabila Ramdani, and on the phone from Oxford, the Imam of the Oxford Islamic Congregation, Dr Taj Harji. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Hello. Nabila, first of all, I know it's a little difficult on radio, but for those listening who may be unfamiliar with the differences in headscarves that we're talking about, can you clarify for us? The French are talking about the niqab or the full face veil. Is that right? Uh, absolutely. And they uh, actually uh, mistakenly call it the burqa ban. Or, or they refer to the piece of garment as a burqa, which is uh, the burqa being, of course, the piece of garment uh, largely uh, worn by uh, women in Afghanistan, for example, which means it has uh, a, a grey defectively in front of the face and covers uh, the face completely. What the law uh, is about in France is uh, what is, uh, in fact, uh, called the niqab, and it's more to do with the kind of um, a veil that uh, women in the Middle East uh, uh, countries like Saudi Arabia in particular uh, wear, which means that it leaves, um, it covers the whole face, but it leaves a uh, slit uh, where you can see the eyes of the woman, but not more than that. Do you subscribe to President Sarkozy's view that this ban will liberate women? I think it, the, the, the ban on the Islamic veil has very little to do with female uh, emancipation at all. And a focus on women's rights is being used to effectively justify intervention in religious and indeed public life that would be otherwise uh, completely unacceptable. Uh, I think it's also important to remember the context in which uh, the burqa ban was, uh, in, uh, the discussion around the burqa ban was introduced uh, last year. It was uh, taking place in the context of a uh, misguided and indeed hugely divided, divisive um, national identity debate, which um, allowed people in town halls, but also on internet uh, chat rooms across the land, and also on government websites, to uh, team with racist invective. And that's uh, what it gave then to, you know, Islamophobia, rather than a genuine discussion about what's uh, Frenchness and uh, the place of Islam within the French society. And it's very obvious that uh, the, the context in which the uh, ban is now going to be implemented on Monday is also taking place in the rerun of last year's national identity debate. But this year, it's placed in the context of uh, yet another debate on the place of Islam uh, within uh, French uh, society. So you do not accept then the assertion that the full veil is, if I can quote, not welcome in France because it's contrary to our values and contrary to the ideals we have of a woman's dignity. I think w we have to bear in mind what the law means. Uh, I have to, uh, I think one uh, needs to look at the cynicism of the text of the law because its express aim is meant to, uh, to be to stop people covering their faces in public. Yet it excludes motorcycle helmets, for example, fencing and ski masks, balaclava, carnival costumes, uh, costumes, sorry, and a whole set of other uh, headgear which happen to cover the face. So what it means in practical terms is that if a woman now chooses to step out of her home wearing a balaclava, a crash helmet, or even a Sarkozy fancy dress mask, for instance, she will be perfectly entitled to do so, and she wouldn't be uh, breaking any law and yet she will still be covering her face. So it's very obvious that a religion is being targeted here. And what it means effectively is that the law, the ban, is telling women how to dress, but it's uh, going beyond that because it criminalizes a handful of women who have chosen a lifestyle of their own in perfect uh, respect of and accordance with the secular nature of French society by choosing to cover their face. Dr. Harji, do you agree with Nabila that a religion is being targeted here because you believe the full face veil should be banned? I mean, she's obviously confusing, like so many Muslims, 
culture with uh, religion. I think we are welcoming the ban for several reasons. I think firstly we say what specifically it is non-Quranic. There's no verse in the Quran that says women should cover their faces. The verses in the Quran says most, both genders should be modestly dressed. There's no mention about the face mask. None whatsoever. And if you want to splice, spice and dice those verses, it still doesn't come to that. We also say it's pre-Islamic. This custom doesn't originate with, with Islam. It comes from Byzantium and the Persian empires, where aristocratic men of those days regarded women as their property and would veil and conceal these, uh, their property, so to speak. And since it's pre-Islamic and it's non-Quranic, ipso facto, it is un-Muslim and unnecessary. We mm -hmm. also oppose this burqa nikah because it, they're interchangeable. The only difference is one has got a mesh over the eyes and others is meshless. But basically it's still a face mask. We also oppose it because it disempowers women. It makes them invisible in the public space. I cannot walk down to local Barclays Bank or any other bank there with a the balaclava or with a motorcycle helmet or with a ski mask and do my business. She, on the other hand, if she chooses, or any other Muslim women chooses to wear the face mask, they will be served in the bank. So we are supposed to live in an equal gender society, but we are uh, uh, tolerating uh, sexist discrimination. If I can cut across there, Dr. Harji, several arguments there. And Nabila, you must say, if it comes to equality, uh, Dr. Harji has a point there, if only in that a man, for example, cannot go about his business with his head covered. Well, first of all, uh, I would like to challenge his view that uh, it, uh, you know that it is not a, a Quranic prescription to cover uh, for a woman to cover her face. Uh, um, with all due respect, he cannot ignore that there are strict interpretations of the of the text which uh, effectively say that it is a prescription. So there's no, a no. there's a there is a tiny uh, uh, branch of. Uh, uh, the uh, of people who in, who are interpreting the text very strictly, and for them they see it as a prescription. So you can't deny these people for having the interpretation they would like no, to have the, of the, the internal text. evidence. Uh, the internal evidence is quite clear. The Quran says, "Do not stare, do not gaze at women." So if they were covered but as by with all marks, religious so texts, if I may interrupt, on, as with on, all on, religious on, texts, it's a matter of no, interpretation, no, you and you cannot uh, uh, no, 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 so they, deny they, the fact it, that there, is, there are people who are interpreting the, the text strictly. This is not the norm. Islam is not a culture. Islam is a religion, and there's a distinction between religion and culture, between faith and traditions. The two are not the same. And for Muslim women to say they want to wear this face mask for religious reasons, I would say no, that's wrong. But if they want to wear it for cultural reasons, because it's a tribal habit, of course, by all means, say this is my tribal habit, this is my cultural thing, and I'm very happy for them to do so. Can we move uh, this uh, argument on, if you like, Nabila? Most women in France who wear the full veil are they doing so by choice or are they being forced into wearing one by a member of the family i've uh, interviewed uh, an awful lot of women who uh, wear the niqab in france and uh, they are telling me most of them uh, who i've met that they are doing it by choice it's not being forced upon them and that's the problem at the core of this law this idea that women are forced into wearing a veil by abusive husbands in france is unsubstantiated and it's not backed by any evidence or statistics and it's so easy to go around and you know ask questions to there are less than 2,000 women who are wearing the niqab in France. And it's very easy to establish a precise database. But the reality is that the government is not in the least interested in their well-being or indeed in, in their safety, as they claim. Because uh, what that's, um, the ban is achieving is, in fact, a double punishment to where we have to bear in mind that uh, a burqa ban will be effectively denying access to women, uh, to public services, such as transports, post offices, schools, administrations, public buildings. It will exclude them from society completely. It is very much a double punishment. Now, I've talked to the police uh, unions, for example. They are clearly telling me that it is not their priority. They do not want to go burger chasing, as they say. Um, and also, there's a problem of uh, the uh, implementation of the law. Uh, what about rich Saudi women parading in burqas on the Champs Elysees to do their shopping? Will they get arrested too, or will their money allow them to be outlaws? So th there are very clear practical problems in enforcing the law. Dr. Harjay, 
do you not accept that a ban is a rather extreme way of uh, changing a centuries-old tradition based on well, either cultural yeah. or religious reasons? Yeah, and firstly, I mean, I think what the French are doing is maybe over the top, but what I think is important for us in Britain is not to encourage this phenomenon here. Because we should have something like the anti-smoking campaign, educating women and, uh, and, and making them understand that this is not a religious requirement, however you want to slice and spice and dice it. But we are talking about targeting the most vulnerable Yes, no, and, and so the point is, how are you going to get them out of this thing? By saying, listen, fine, this is a, this is a religious requirement, it's a cultural tra- tradition. You're only reinforcing disempowering, you're reinforcing the isolation, you're reinforcing the invisibility. Ronnie Conry is still in the studio with me. Ronnie, as you can hear, this is a complex issue. What yes. are your concerns? Well, I think there's a, there's a bigger issue here, and, and that is... I'm just uncomfortable with the idea of the state actually dictating what it is appropriate for people to wear. And, you know, there is a push in this country to see religion privatised, privatised to the extent that religion should have no role in public life. And that's normally expressed through saying, oh, well, churches should keep their views to themselves, people should express themselves on a Sunday and so on. But the way Islamic women choose to dress is an expression of their faith and that's to me that's a perfectly legitimate expression of their faith and it shouldn't be pushed to the sides or outlawed or privatised. I mean if you think back from my own faith background in the early part of the 19th century priests and nuns were banned from wearing their habits in public before Catholic emancipation. Now we've moved on from that we've we've recognised that that was an affront to their their rights and that that religious dress should be allowed to be worn among Christians. So I I would feel awkward about denying um, right to dress appropriately as they would see it to, to Muslims. Let's leave the discussion there. My thanks indeed to Nabila Ramdani and Dr Tarj Harji for joining me this morning.